So last week we finished up our series on our core values. If you missed that, you can go back, check it out on YouTube. Uh, it's just an incredible series to discover who we are, what it is that God is asking of us in this life. And we talked about hope and healing and peace and purpose. Last week specifically, we talked about purpose. It was so great hearing so many of your stories. Uh, Laura and I were actually in Colorado watching online, just like you're doing right now, and hearing the stories was so phenomenal. Because we believe this, you were created on purpose for a purpose. And the way in which we kind of discover and live out our purpose is through these two practices that we have of generous giving and sacrificial serving. So this past week, when it came to giving, when it came to giving to others, when it came to serving others, do you, I want you to think about what you do this week. What is a way in which that you gave to others or you served others? Would you think about that? And what I'd like for you to do, wherever you're gathered, if you're in your neighborhood gathering or you're gathered with your family, or maybe if you're alone, you can put it into the chat. How, how did you practice that this week? How, how did you live out your purpose through giving and through serving? Maybe one of those, and I want you to share that with somebody right now. So today, starting a brand new series, uh, super excited about this, Presidents, Prophets, and Kings. The answer is not in the White House. The answer is in our house. Now, it may be a strange title for a series, but here's how I want you to think about this. Uh, during this series, we're going to talk about uh, how do we bring about change in our culture and in our world. And we're gonna be looking at a prophet in the Old Testament. In fact, if you wanna look it up right now, 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 Kings 18. We're gonna be looking at this guy named Elijah. We're gonna be looking at one story in particular, and we're gonna look at the story and break it down over the next four weeks because I, I believe in this story is where we are going to discover the change and how do we bring about change in our culture. Again, it's, it's not in the White House, it's in our house. So many people are relying on a presidential election, and that's going to fix everything. And we as followers of Jesus know that's just not, not true. And the same was true in this prophet Elijah's day. And in fact, um, there was a king, his name was Ahab. And you go back uh, seven generations of kings, and the, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, if you don't know their story, they didn't have a king. God was their king. But they said, we want a king like the other nations have. And God said, I'm your king. And they said, no, we want a king. And so God said, okay, I'll give you a king. And then if you read through those seven generations, other than David, it says, and this king came up and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then the next king, and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The king was not the answer. But in every generation, God raised up a prophet for that generation to call the people back to God. And I believe what God is asking of us right now is for all of us to be prophets in our generation, to be prophets in our home, in our workplaces, in our classrooms, and on our, our campuses, and, and on our ball fields, wherever it is that we gather. I think God is calling all of us to be like Elijah, to be to be prophets, and that is how the change is gonna come about because of the things that we do. So let's look at it. First Kings chapter 18, and uh, let me give you just a little bit of background on this story. Uh, Ahab has just jacked up Israel. There are idols, there are shrines to other gods. They've completely stopped worshiping uh, God, Yahweh, Jehovah, their God, the, the God of the Israelites. And worship is just not even happening anymore. He's one of the most wicked kings that we read about in the Old Testament. It got so bad, God sent a drought on the land for three years. So it hadn't rained for three years. And Elijah was the prophet that God raised up to speak on behalf of God, to call the people back to God. And so he gets to this point where he says, you know what, we're going to have a showdown between the prophets of Baal, that was the God that they were following at that time, and, and he alone, by himself, the only prophet, the prophet of God. And so they gathered on this mountain, Mount Carmel. Some of you may know this story. And they gather on this mountain, and they set up two altars. 
one altar is to the, uh, to the uh, God of Baal. And, and Elijah says, you guys go first. And so he, he says, you guys go first. And they go first and, and nothing happens. They're calling down fire from, from the heavens to burn up the sacrifice and nothing is happening. And so Elijah stop, starts mocking them. This is what I love about scripture is it's full of sarcasm and mocking. It is, this is my kind of prophet right here. This is how I like to roll. Plus it gives me permission scripturally to do it. And so Elijah Elijah's mocking them and he's like, hey, maybe you should pray louder. Hey, maybe, maybe you should bang some things. Hey, you know, maybe, maybe your God is going to the bathroom. He actually says that to them. Nothing happens. And then it's Elijah's turn. Look with me at verse 30. It says, then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the, of the tribes of Israel. He used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. And then he said this. Remember, there's a drought going on. Fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood, not making him a popular man right now. Uh, after they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. So they did it again. And when they were finished, he said, do it, do it a third time. So they're not, they're not fans of this guy at all. So they did as he said, and, and the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. It says, at the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, which they had not been doing, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and he prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Think of this, just a simple prayer. And look what God does. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground. They cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. I want to talk to you in just these few minutes about worship, about worship. In fact, the title of my message today is Worshiping in a Distracted World. Worshiping in a distracted world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the moments we have to gather here online, wherever we are. We are asking your spirit to speak to us. Would you change us? Would you make us new? Teach us something new about yourself so we can become more like your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. So we all have things that we are uh, passionate about, and uh, it's not hard to spot it. In fact, I can throw out a date, and, and I can tell if you're passionate about it, okay? October 23rd. Some of you know what I'm talking about right there. You're like, yeah, the iPhone 12 release party. That's when the iPhone 12 is coming out. Some of you already sold a kidney. You, you, you've taken out your second mortgage. You're like, I am getting that phone. How about another date? October 30th. That's a little tougher. Some of, you, some of you are there, aren't you? Yeah, that, that is when Mandalorian comes out. We're going to, we got a little, the, the, uh, we, it's the date. That's, some of you are like, yes, that is it. I, I, I can't wait for season two of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Mandalorian. All right, here's, here's one, November 3rd. <laughs> some of you are dreading that date, I know. But some of you are super excited about that date. I, and you know, you know, uh, and it's crazy you're seeing uh, the Trump stuff and the, and the uh, Biden stuff. My, I got to be honest. I, I am loving the Trump supporters. You guys, you guys are off the chain. I mean, your support for, for Donald Trump is, whether you like him or not, I, it's not beside the point. Like, I mean, you talk about pickup trucks with flags that look like a sail that belongs on a sailboat. I mean, it's just, it's bigger than the truck. I mean, you're, like, for instance, you're, you're, not, see, you're not seeing Joe Biden uh, flags on Priuses. It's just, you're, you're not seeing it. Now, I realize I just stereotype both parties, but hey, again, I am Elijah. That's who I am. So, I mean, the, we have these different dates. So maybe it's, maybe it's not a date. Maybe it's a date. Like, you get, you're passionate about him, passionate about her. Laura and I, when we were in Colorado at one, one of the parks, I saw this young couple walking up, and, man, you could just tell they were on a date. She had on the wolf jeans. That's, that's what I call them, the ones that look like they've been shredded by a pack of wolves. That's the jeans she had on. He had on a button-down shirt like the one I'm wearing. I'm like, what guy wears a button-down shirt to the park? 
and they both had pumpkins in their hands. And they're just walking along. You could tell they're like, we're going to carve our pumpkins today. Oh, this is so cute. We're just so in love. We are all, we're all passionate about something or someone. But I want to ask you here, how is your passion for Jesus today in this season? For some of you, when I say that, you, you're like, man, Brad, uh, honestly, uh, for me, it's red hot. I mean, honestly, it, it's just, I, I, I sense the presence of God. I, the peace of God in this season is unexplainable. The joy that I have, I feel like I'm walking in step with him. The scriptures are coming alive. I hear his voice, but, but for, for some of you, that's not the case. It's the opposite of that. You're like, man, Brad, I... <laughs> Honestly, I don't have any passion right now. Uh, the, the fire isn't there. I, I've kind of been overwhelmed by everything that's been taking place, and I just don't really sense God's presence. I don't have a lot of joy. I don't have a lot of peace. Can I, can I just help you for a moment? Every one of us go through seasons like that. Every one of us go through these times where the passion just isn't there. So if the passion is not there, how do you get it back? Or if it is there, how do you keep it? Like, because you, you don't want to lose it. How do you keep it? I, I want you to write this down, because this is what we're going to talk about for just a few minutes here. Worship restores the wonder and awe of God. Worship restores the wonder and awe of God. In other words, it restores the passion that I have for God. When we look here at the nation of Israel, they had lost their passion for God. They had stopped worshiping God. And so here's Elijah. Elijah comes along and he is intent on reestablishing worship. Elijah, he is passionate about God. And he said, we're going to reestablish the worship. Look, look at verse 30, the first part of verse 30. It says this, then Elijah, Elijah called to the people, say this with me, come over here. Say it again, come over here. Now here's the thing, Elijah wasn't calling the people over to an altar. What he was really doing is he was calling the people back to God. Think about this. God had led the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, into the promised land. If you don't know that story, you need to read about it. Because, I mean, they, the land flowing with milk and honey, he gave them everything their hearts could have ever desired, led them out of slavery and bondage, placed them in this land, and now, all of a sudden, we go a few generations forward, and they had not kicked out the foreign nations that were among them, that God had told them to do. They began to live among them, and what happened is the world started calling to them, come over here, come over here. And they slowly started neglecting worship. And they started building shrines, building temples, and building idols to other gods. Instead of God being the center of their worship, he got pushed over to the side. And we read this and we think, man, how could that even be possible? How could they get distracted? I mean, this is the God who brought them into the promised land. But come on, I think we are all just as susceptible it is so easy to get distracted right now. I mean, the world is constantly saying to you and to me, come over here. Just pick up your phone. Let's just talk about just the phone, okay? Pick up your phone, and what do you got? You got news headlines staring you in the face going, you need to read. Look what Donald Trump did. Look what Joe Biden did. Look what the pandemic is doing. Look at the natural disasters. And this big headline, it says, come over here. Or, or maybe you're on, have you ever seen the clickbait? It's off to the side on, 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 your, on your screen, or maybe it's down near the bottom, and it's like, 20 celebrities who've let themselves go. Number six will surprise you. And, and you're just like, yeah, and the world's saying, come over here. Or let's just talk about the red dot. <laughs> the red dot on your phone. There's that email. Uh, I, I, I probably should check that. Or a uh, social media notification. I, 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 and it's constantly saying, come over here. Here, I mean, if you're a parent and you've got kids, and there's all kinds of activities that people are saying, sign your kid up, sign your kid up, sign your kid up. But you're like, man, there's a pandemic going on. But they're saying, sign your kid up, sign your, they're saying, come over here. I want you to share for just 30 seconds. Just take a moment. I want you to share with somebody in your neighborhood gathering or wherever you are right now. I want you to share, what is it right now that's got you distracted? What's the one thing that gets you? Take a moment, share that.
So in the New Testament, John is one of the disciples of Jesus. He's one of these guys that refused to be distracted. He was red hot, passionate for the things of Christ. In fact, so much so that when you read about the Last Supper, the final meal that Jesus had with his disciples, where was John? John said, I'm gonna be right next to Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead and they said, hey, the tomb is empty, you read the story about John and he, he didn't walk to the tomb, he didn't wait on someone else, it says he ran to the tomb. This is a guy who was passionate about Jesus. And in one of his letters, 1 John 2.15, he said this, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. Come on, turn to somebody wherever you are and say, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. Verse 17, he says this, this world is what? Say it with me, fading away. This world is fading away along with everything that people crave. In other words, it's all cotton candy. I mean, the second it hits your taste buds, it's gone. And the only thing it does is creates a craving for more in this endless, endless search that we get on. And I believe what Jesus is saying to his church today and saying to us as a church today is, come over here. Come over here. Let me be the object of your worship. May may I be your passion. Come back to me. Looking back at the story with Elijah in verse 30, the second part of that verse in 1 Kings, it says this, they all crowded around him as he what? Say it with me. He repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. Think about that for just a moment. Not only were they worshiping other gods, not only had they built shrines and built uh, temples and built idols to other gods, but they actually tore down the altars of God, tore them down. They're they're not even worshiping. People are, are walking by. Nobody's really noticing that the worship of God has been neglected and it's no longer happening. Like what's going on here? They, they don't even see it anymore. It's like a couple weeks ago, I was at the doctor's office and the nurse took me into one of the exam rooms and when she opened up the door, the light was just flickering like this, just on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. And I was like, whoa. And she, and she actually said, well, I apologize. This is the only room we have open and it's kind of been like this for a week now and we just haven't gotten it fixed. A week? A week? And I go into this room, they shut the door. I'm sitting at the exam room. It's just doing this. It's like a 90s nightclub, okay? Just blinking on a baby, hit me one more time. I mean, it's just on and on and on and on. And you know what's crazy? After about 15 minutes, I didn't even really notice it anymore. That was so strange. This is what's happened to the Israelites. They just gotten used to it. Seven generations of doing evil in the sight of the Lord, and God slowly got pushed to the margins and nobody noticed and nobody paid attention anymore. I, I just would say, I, I fear that God has been pushed to the margins, not in our culture and not in our world, but in his church. Like we are like Israel. It's not the world that's the problem. It's our hearts and our souls the problem. He is no longer the object of our worship. And I think God is looking for Elijah's. I think God is asking you today, if you'll be an Elijah who will stand up, who will repair the altar of the Lord. I think God is saying to you and he's saying to me, will you return to me? Will you make me the object and the affection and the passion of your worship? Will you make me the center of your life? In other words, again, the answer is not in the White House. The answer is in my house. So how do you repair the altar? How do we return to worship? How do we get that passion back? Let's go to verse 31. It says that Elijah took 12 stones, one to represent each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he used, say it with me, what? The stones. The stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. What's Elijah doing here? This is, this is important. Elijah was showing them, the people, they, they were the altar. They represented, their, their lives were an act of worship. Peter, who was, if you don't know who Peter was, another disciple of Jesus, he's the one who led the, the early church. In one of his letters, he said this, you are living stones. 
Come on, turn to somebody and tell them you are alive in Christ. You are alive in Christ. You are a living stone that God is building into what? His, his spiritual temple. His spiritual temple. In other words, my life is an altar. Uh, what I do, what I say, what I post, what I write, my actions, it's all a display of worship to God. And I believe what God is calling you and I to do today is to rebuild the altar of our hearts and to reestablish worship and him as the primary person that we worship in Jesus. And so I wanna give you just two practical things that I believe that you can do. Because if you're like, man, if, how do I restore and rebuild the altar? Here's two simple things you can do. Write these down. Number one, daily worship. Daily worship. We don't just worship for the time that we have right now. This is not the only time we worship. Every day is a day of worship. And I want to encourage you, start with the scriptures. Like you gotta start in the scriptures, it's foundational. It, it, it sets the course for your day, the direction that I'm gonna go in. I wanna tell you this, you will, like the children of Israel, when we read about Josiah, another king, Josiah discovered they had forgotten the law, they'd forgotten the book of the law, they'd forgotten the, the promises of God, they were no longer looking to the scriptures to guide them, and what that meant was the idols were going up, the shrines were going up, the temples were going up, and the altars to God were going down. That happens in our lives when we don't look to the scriptures. I wanna encourage you, look, to the scriptures, because I, I, here's what God's going to do. When you look to the scriptures every day, he's going to help you to see, here's an idol that's coming up. Here's a shrine you're starting to build. And, and he's going to say, hey, listen, this is an altar. My altar is being tore down. And he's going to guide you. So we need to daily worship. But not only do we need to daily worship, write this down. Number two, we need to have a day of worship. A day of worship what you're doing right now. Sunday worship. Can I just, uh, just applaud you for what you're doing? Can I, can I just say, way to go? If you're in a neighborhood gathering, turn to somebody and tell them, way to go, you're doing the right thing. Gathering together as the body of Christ is the right thing to be doing. Because here's what today is. Today is a day of declaration. That's what I consider Sunday. It's a day of declaration. In other words, it's I am saying now, nothing else comes before my God. There is, there is nothing that, that I would worship, give my money to, give my declaration to, give my, give my worship to, give my passion to. God, that every day, every week, you're saying this. When you gather for worship, you're saying, no, no, I am, this is a day of declaration. I am reaffirming and reconfirming that I will worship God. It's, it's not just about the fourth commandment, but I believe it's also about the first commandment. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And I know for some of you, you're like, hey, we're not under the law anymore, so why are you talking about Ten Commandments? Just remember that Sabbath was something established by God at creation, and Sabbath was something that Jesus did when he walked this earth. But I think we made too big of a deal out of commandment number four and not a big enough deal out of commandment number one. It all starts by saying, don't have any other gods before me. What, what God right now is coming before your worship of God Almighty. Laura and I, as I mentioned, we were last week, we were in Golden, Colorado. Uh, just had a phenomenal time of resting. And I say resting, but you know, when you go on vacation, it's crazy. You go on vacation, you ever come back from vacation, you're more tired than when you went on vacation? <laughs> What is that? Why do we do this to ourselves? Like, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna, and we're going to Colorado. Come on, people. We're, maybe you're not in Oklahoma. Maybe you're watching in Colorado right now. Those of us in Oklahoma, listen, we live for those moments when we can go to a beach or the mountains because we ain't got that here. And so we were like, we're going to take advantage of every moment of that. And so going hiking, they had a creek we could walk by. They had these amazing shops in, in the downtown area uh, and, and it just on and on and on. And Believe it or not, the most refreshing and the best moment Laura and I ever had when we were there was at the city park. We walked by it every single day. Every day we walked by the park and I kept thinking, uh, that, that looks like fun, but man, let's go hiking. This looks like fun, but let's walk by the creek. This looks like fun, but let's go, let's, let's go downtown. Let's go out to eat. Let's do these other things. There's so much to do here. And one day we decided we're going to go for, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to stop and we're going we're gonna to go to the park. And so we got a blanket. 
man, I, I got, my, uh, got my phone with my music, and I was, I was putting on some good old 70s stuff, had a little Chicago playing. It was Saturday in the park. You know what song I played? Saturday in the park. Oh, so that was playing. It was in, and I and I lay down on this blanket, and the warmth of the Colorado sun, mountain sun, was just hitting my face. Oh my goodness! And there was this gentle, cool mountain breeze. Are you there? <laughs> You're there, aren't you? <laughs> you want to be there, don't you? It was on. Believable. Listen, this week you're going to face a lot of options, a lot of opportunities of going here and going there and, and doing this. The world is going to say to you, come over here. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you're wore out. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe the passion is kind of not there right now for Jesus. I want to tell you this, that Jesus is saying to you, come over here. Because when you take time to worship, when you take time to worship God Almighty and make him your affection and your passion, I can tell you this, you will feel the warmth of the Son of God on your face. And you will feel the gentle breeze of his spirit. There is nothing like it. Worship, worship restores the wonder and the awe of God.